Hey everybody, welcome. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week we are trying to bring you cool and interesting material that will make you go, hmm, that's interesting, and hopefully it'll inspire you to act in some way, whether that's act in service uh, or, or perhaps even act in self-defense. Why do I say that? Because we are going to learn some really interesting stuff over the coming minutes. And uh, that is a function of having as our speaker today, uh, Thomas Smith. He goes by Tom when we're just speaking, so I'll refer to him as Tom. And uh, Tom wrote an article uh, recently that, uh, that I've, I found uh, in One Zero, I think via Medium. Um, and, uh, and, and I finished reading that article and thought, holy poop. So, so <laughs> as a result of that, I, I sort of reached out to him to say, <laughs> could you speak to our, our, our Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley? And he was gracious enough to write back. Uh, I will, I, you have read a little bit about his bio coming in, uh, if, if you are catching this as part of the, the program in our meeting, uh, but I'll let him add any details from there because I wanna go ahead and hand it over to him. Tom, welcome to the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, it was a scary experience to read my article and I was saying to people here, it was a scary experience to report it as well. Uh, so uh, definitely we're all, yeah, all feeling the same thing there. Um, so I'll just start out here by uh, quickly going into a little bit about who I am. Um, my name is Thomas Smith. I'm the CEO of Gato Images and we're an AI driven photography company based just outside Silicon Valley. I'm also a working photographer myself, and I'm a technology journalist, as you mentioned, for a variety of publications, including, in this case, Medium's publication One Zero. And I'm here today to talk about a company called Clearview AI. Um, and this company was basically operating in the shadows for many years and was revealed to the public in a major expose in the New York Times in January of this year. And in that piece, the New York Times called Clearview a company that might end privacy as we know it. So obviously that's a, a pretty big thing to say. Um, and uh, you know, it's, I think, something that is actually warranted. So why did the Times feel that this was something that could end privacy as we know it? Um, basically, a, it's a, Clearview AI is a facial recognition and AI company that has gone out and gathered 3.1 billion images from the public internet, scraping and grabbing absolutely anything that they can get their hands on, from Facebook profiles to um, articles in you know, niche publications, personal blogs, um, the websites of academic institutions, even things like mugshots um, from different uh, you know, federal and, and state agencies and police agencies. And they've combined all of this together into a giant facial recognition database and they've pulled out all of the faces that are in those 3.1 billion images that they've scraped from the public internet and organized this together into profiles. So they've grouped together all of the people that they found um, in these pictures. And what it yields is a database where um, they can upload a photo of nearly any person in the United States and increasingly almost anyone anywhere in the world. And from one single photo with no other context, no information about who the person is, not even their name, Clearview was able to actually pull up a profile of that person and learn um, all kinds of things about them. Uh, their identity, their name, where they're located, uh, oftentimes their age, known associates, and they can start to jump down the chain and actually find people you're connected to, pull up their profiles in this giant facial recognition database. Um, and, and track them, um, you know, basically any information that they want to know about any person. Again, just based on one single image of a person's face. And, you know, being a, a tech reporter for One Zero um, and really focused on privacy issues, obviously this was really alarming. So um, I'm in California and within about two weeks, I would say, of this report coming out in the New York Times, I made use of a law that was extremely new at the time. Um, it just basically came into effect on January 1st of this year of 2020 called the, Cons the California Consumer Privacy Act. And um, this is a, a really landmark piece of legislation here in the United States. There's a component of it that's similar to a law in Europe, but it's really the first of its kind in the US. And it gives consumers um, broad rights to access and to amend and delete data that large companies have gathered on them. So before companies like Clearview could operate really totally in the shadows, no one knew what they were gathering about us, nobody really had any uh, options to do anything about it. 
And the CCPA now gives consumers tools to actually kind of fight back on that and learn what these companies know about us and even to have that data amended or deleted. So within two weeks of the Times uh, expose about Clearview AI, I filed my own CCPA request to the company. And um, again, this just came into effect at the beginning of the year. So it was kind of a painful, long process, a lot of back and forth, proving my identity, um, proving that I had the right to the materials I was requesting. Uh, and it took about two months, I would say, of back and forth with Clearview before they finally acknowledged my request. And what they uh, ultimately ended up doing was running a search against their database to show me the profile that they had gathered um, on me, again, from doing this facial recognition uh, across photos from the public internet. So I gave them this photo. Uh, it's me making latkes. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot going on visually here. And I did that deliberately. I wanted to, uh, to see what they could find about me using the kind of photo that anybody might post on social media, might post on a personal blog. This is not a professionally lit uh, headshot of me. Uh, it's not even like a mugshot type of image. This is just something that I would routinely post on the internet. And uh, I had them run it through their database. My estimation is, uh, even though it took two months to get to that point, the actual search seemed to only take them less than a minute. And that aligns with data from the reporter from the New York, New York Times, too. And uh, what they came back with was basically everything about me. So this is the, uh, the report. Um, and this is all in my article on 1.0 on Medium, if you want to see more on it. But basically, from that one original search image that you can see in the upper left, they found a meetup profile about me that I created when I first moved to California in 2013. Um, articles about me in the uh, publication, the alumni publication for my alma mater, Johns Hopkins University. My Facebook profile page, including every post that I have made public over the last 10 years. Um, a personal blog that I had started with my wife right after we were married. Um, my faculty advisor and, uh, and details about her. Um, in addition, they found uh, the, the Facebook profile of one of my family members. I've redacted uh, their image here uh, in red. And um, you know, so basically from this, if somebody was looking me up in the system, they could find where I work, um, where I live, my name, my age, and uh, my family members and many of my known associates, even before I made everything private, pictures of my kids, um, so it's really a, a pretty shocking amount of data that somebody can get using Clearview AI's system and only a single photo of me that you could easily find on the internet or take out in public. Um, most concerning to me, though, is look at the last guy there on the right, um, Alexei Postikov, apparently. Obviously, that's not me. Um, he came up in my search, though. So if I was being investigated uh, for something and somebody pulled up my profile, they could think that person was an alias. Uh, and if that person had actually committed any kind of crime, I could end up being blamed for that because again, there's incorrect information in my profile. And again, I would never have known this um, unless I used these tools to go out and, and find what they had gathered about me. Um, so, you know, again, why is this concerning? For one thing, they've gathered this huge database. They've made it really easy to uh, pull it with a single image. But I think where it gets scarier is when you start to look at who Clearview AI works with. And that's at the moment over 2,400 police agencies all over the United States and all over the world, including ICE, um, retailers like Macy's, and they've even provided their service um, to selected individuals. They've given some people uh, who are considering using this uh, a mobile phone app where they can take a picture of anybody running through the database and pull up the same kind of profile that I uh, saw about me. Um, there was reports that somebody used that to surveil one of his daughter's potential dates before she got together. So really some abuses of power there already. Um, but even without that, you know, obviously this could be used in the context and has reportedly been used in the context of protests. If you're out at a protest, a police agency could um, take pictures of you in the crowd and instantly using Clearview systems, pull up uh, your profile and learn the same kinds of things they learned about me, about you, and start to build profiles of who's been attending different protests uh, and start to gather that over time and track people really easily without a warrant, without having to really do a lot of the police work that would normally be associated with that. Um, there's even apparently code in their systems to integrate this with augmented reality glasses. 
So you could actually uh, walk through a crowd as a police officer and have people's profiles and their names and information pulled up and uh, superimposed above their heads as you're out you know, walking your beat. So really um, you know, pretty scary uh, capabilities here. There are definitely legitimate uses for the technology. Um, Clearview emphasizes how they use this to catch uh, child predators, for example. So there's really aberrant crimes that this can be used to prosecute. Um, it can be used to solve cold cases, but it can also um, really easily, I think, be abused. And also most people probably are not aware that this even exists or that Clearview very likely has a detailed profile about them that's searchable using only a picture of their face. And as the Times pointed out, you know, somebody could even use this for blackmail. They could record you talking uh, in a public setting, saying something embarrassing, maybe sharing a trade secret about your company, find out who you are, contact you and, and blackmail you uh, into, into paying a ransom or else they would release the information in the, in the recording associated with, uh, with your face. Um, other issues here, uh, not with Clearview system, but earlier this year, this, there was the first documented arrest of a person based solely on facial recognition data. His name was Robert Williams and he was arrested uh, incorrectly because his face came up as a match in a facial recognition database. So we don't know whether that's happened with, with uh, Clearview services yet, but uh, it's certainly something that's starting to happen. Um, and people actually are being wrongfully arrested and even jailed um, because they've shown up in these kinds of databases. So, you know, I published this article uh, on One Zero. It's received uh, over 100,000 views. Um, it's been republished all over the place. And there's just been, I think, a tremendous outpouring of interest and concern uh, about this. So what are some of the impacts that have come out of this research and this revelation? Um, firstly, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, has filed a landmark class action lawsuit against Clearview AI using a law in Illinois that uh, prohibits gathering of biometric data. Um, my, my piece was actually cited, this is uh, part of the text of their complaint, was actually cited in that lawsuit. Um, it's also led to several major tech companies uh, exiting the field of facial recognition entirely. For example, IBM has, um, has exited the field and several other companies have announced a moratorium on doing facial recognition uh, in their platforms. So I think that's a very positive move that should be applauded. Um, we've also seen legislation starting to come out to ban the use of these kinds of technologies in specific places. San Francisco has already moved to do that. The state of New Jersey has declared a moratorium on many of these uses. And just recently, we have a new act um, that was put forward by Bernie Sanders, among others, called the National Biometric Information Privacy Act that would prohibit these kinds of uses on a broader national scale. Um, so, you know, I would encourage you if you or looking at what I'm saying here, and it's, uh, it's freaking you out as it did to me. Uh, if you live in California, if you live in, uh, in Europe, uh, you can actually go and file a, a request to get your own data from Clearview. I encourage you to do that. Uh, I've included the link here to do that. And also, um, you know, look at the legislation that's coming out, follow along with that, um, and keep an eye on what's going on. Because again, as consumers, um, it's really up to us in a lot of cases to defend our own rights and with things like CCPA and these new emerging laws, we have the tools to do that. And finally, if you want to follow along as I continue my coverage of Clearview AI and other tech privacy issues, uh, please follow me at uh, 10.medium.com. Um, so, you know, again, very scary stuff, but at least as consumers, we do now have the tools that we need to start to fight back on this. Thank you. Excellent, Tom. Um, holy poop. So uh, as, as, we, as, as we look at these different pieces, there are a lot of questions that I think we're going to leap into. I do want to introduce the people on the recording. Uh, my name is Rushton Hurley. I'm one of the members of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, uh, part of the team that started it and launched in January of 2015. We're real proud about that. I'm sure Clearview knows this. Um, and then uh, I also want to introduce our other members. So uh, with the paella behind him is our paella master, Shags Chagrin in Walnut Creek. And then uh, manning the recording, he said, uh, w w without perfect uh, uh, gender recognition pronouns on that, would, would be uh, our, our membership chair, Farheen Abbasi. All right? And so Farheen, thank you for all the work you're doing with this as well. Tom, I'll start the questions. Uh, so so another, another place I encountered this story is, you know, you talked about it being in a New York Times expose. 
Um, that also uh, made it into the New York Times daily podcast called The Daily, which is one of my favorite podcasts because of the, the depth that they can go into on stories. And I remember them talking about the, the, the lack of, of sense of um, boundaries with regard to who they might be selling this information to. You mentioned, for example, that somebody had checked on, on a daughter's date, right? Um, but but ha has, first of all, characterize where perhaps they were and where any progress might have been made with regard to Clearview AI making some decisions about whom they sell this, this technology to. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. I mean, I think in the, in the very early days um, when they were really under the radar, uh, they were making this available to almost anyone. Um, and they, they very aggressively went after a lot of police agencies. And part of that was allowing people to use the service for personal reasons, to test it out, um, to use it uh, you know, with their officers without necessarily getting permission first. Um, and that's definitely come under fire. And they also, I think, didn't quite know what their business model was in the very beginning. So they were opening this up to retail, for example. I mentioned Macy's. There's other retailers that apparently used the services um, to research customers. Uh, they didn't do a huge number of searches in, in most cases, but you know, hundreds to thousands of searches during their, um, their test process there. So the idea would be you, know, you walk into a high-end retail store and the customer service people know who you are and probably know your income level and other things before you even start to shop. Um, since then, I think Clearview has, at least in their own telling, pulled back from that. They're now focused certainly in their messaging, a lot more on um, the use cases for police agencies um, and, you know, especially around things like investigating cold cases, investigating these really terrible crimes like uh, child sexual abuse. Um, so I think, you know, they're emphasizing that a lot more. One thing that, uh, that other reporters have noticed is that there was a major overhaul to their website uh, just after the, the Times article came out. Um, now it much more emphasizes, uh, again, these sort of, you know, uh, law enforcement uses, responsible use of the technology. Um, one thing I would say, though, is that, you know, Clearview is only one company doing this. And it's easy to get hung up on them as a company because they um, are doing it in such a sort of aggressive way. But these technologies to, to build something like Clearview, as I pointed out in the One Zero article, have existed for a while. And the reason that it, it hasn't been used for this before is more just that the industry uh, kind of got together and decided that it shouldn't be. So big players like Google and Facebook um, basically decided that they wouldn't use their services around facial recognition to do this. Now that the cat's out of the bag, we're already starting to see other services duplicate what Clearview is doing. Because as much as it's impressive to build a service that uses 3.1 billion public images, it's also something that um, anyone with access to these sort of commodity technologies like web scraping and facial recognition could do for probably a few million dollars. Mm -hmm. And um, because there's so many different applications, because laws are different in many other jurisdictions, we're already starting to see some clones of Clearview come out. And I think we'll start to see more and more of that. All right, Farheen, I know you have a question. Um, Tom, thank you so much. While you were talking, I was just kind of clicking away of trying to research this. This was really, really fascinating. Um, and, you know, as someone who has probably a lot of data out there from, you know, these YouTube videos that we make to, um, you know, my Facebook profi profile to my LinkedIn, you know, what you're saying is it is very scary. Um, so my question is, um, how do I use the CCPA to know what information is out there about me? Um, yeah, that's kind of my first thing. And then I want to ask something else. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, the CCPA, if you live in California, and even increasingly, if you don't, um, many companies, I'm not sure if Clearview would do this, probably not, but many companies now have opened up uh, CCPA requests to people outside of California. So the law gives you as a consumer a couple of different rights. Um, one is to access the data the companies have gathered about you. Um, and that's, uh, there's certain restrictions on which companies are, are eligible. Um, that's usually uh, companies that have gathered profiles on over 50,000 Californians or meet a revenue threshold, I believe it's $20 million a year. So basically it's applying to larger companies, not necessarily startups, but it's applying to smaller companies like Clearview 
if they've gathered profiles on, uh, on a lot of different Californian consumers. Um, so the first thing is to check if a company is, is eligible under CCPA. Um, and again, in many cases, companies are, especially larger companies, even ones outside of tech. You know, people can file a CCPA request to learn what a retailer knows about them, for example. So uh, ensuring that they're eligible. Uh, the next part is to contact the company and to formally make a CCPA request. And um, there's certain requirements now that companies have to include in their privacy policies, uh, at least two ways that you can reach out and do that. Often it's an email and a contact form. Um, for, for Clearview, I have um, their, uh, their uh, URL there is just clearview.ai slash privacy slash requests. You fill out the form. I believe you can also email privacy at clearview.ai. Um, again, for many companies, it's the same general format, privacy at you know, whatever their email address is. Um, there's not necessarily a format you have to follow to make a CCPA request. Um, you just have to identify who you are um, and, uh, and that you are making that request. Then the companies have, usually it's, there's not a, a clearly defined time, but they have about 60 days to respond. And they have to make sure that it's a verifiable request. Um, so what does that mean? You know, I could, for example, go out and make a Clearview request for somebody that I'm trying to research or track um, and it would not be legitimate and they should not respond to those kinds of requests and just hand over data willy nilly. So they have to prove that you are who you actually say you are. Um, and different companies approach that in, in different ways. Um, some of them uh, use a, a similar service to what you would use if you applied for credit, where they use a, a third party um, ID verification service where you might have to enter, it'll you know, ask you questions, you enter your name and contact info and it would say, have you ever lived at this address? And you'd say yes or no, and it would verify your identity that way. Um, a lot of others require you to send a copy of your driver's license. Um, that can be a little bit scary to send it to a company like this, um, but you know, my feeling was uh, I, they already know a lot about me, so um, it was important for me to get this data. So for Clearview, I sent them a copy of my driver's license. And then once they've verified your request, um, again, you have a few rights. So one of them is to access the data that they've gathered about you. Um, and uh, that can be whatever format uh, the company has it in. And in this case, it was basically the request that uh, the response that a police officer would get if they ran a search on me. For others, it could be a, a database dump. Um, for other companies, they actually give you access to all of the data that you would get through this kind of request by default. So Facebook, for example, you can actually download all of your data without even having to file a CCPA request. Um, you can also then, once you have this, request to be removed from the database, and you can request to have the data um, deleted if you want to, if you're a consumer in California. So I chose to leave my data in uh, Clearview's database. Um, I'm actually more concerned about data that's wrong or missing um, than data that's accurate if scary. Um, but many people would probably choose to have this removed uh, from a platform like Clearview. Um, so you have that right uh, in, in California. And you can often amend data if you feel that it's uh, wrong. And in some cases, you can request that they stop gathering data on you going forward. Um, so a lot of protections, if you know how to uh, actually exercise them. The law went into effect on January 1st, and it started to be enforced with penalties starting, I believe, on July 1st of this year. Um, so now if a company does not comply, uh, they face a penalty of up to $7,500 per instance of non-compliance. So you can imagine when a company like Clearview, if they just decided to ignore the CCPA um, and everybody, you know, even uh, 100,000 people filed a request, they could be on the hook for quite a lot of damages. Um, so companies are taking it very seriously. Um, a lot of them, because I think of COVID, uh, are not as responsive as probably they hope to be. Um, but the California Attorney General is beginning to enforce uh, CCPA. They're not waiting for COVID to be more stable. So if you're a consumer in California, and again, increasingly, even if you're not, uh, go out, file these requests, and then you'll be amazed what you can learn. Um, so then a follow up to that real quickly. So I'm actually on the, the privacy request form site. Um, and it's, yeah, so this is for California residents, you can opt out data access or data deletion. So mm -hmm. if I click, for example, the data access, because now I'm really curious, what do they have yeah. on me? I um, mean, you know, it takes you to this form, right? And mm -hmm. you're right, one of the steps of the form says, please submit a photo of a government issued ID for the person who is subject of this request. So is it safe for me to submit a, you know, my, my driver's license photo, right? Because that also has personal information on there that can, would be concerning for a company like this to, to have. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a really legitimate question. Um, and one of the concerns is that um, usually Clearview has said when somebody submits a search photo, like if a police officer uploaded a photo of a suspect, um, they don't retain that photo and add it to the database. So if I'm searching, you know, for suspects and I upload somebody and they turn out to not be uh, involved in the crime, they're not then stored in the database and associated with the company. CCPA requests, on the other hand, there is a, a um, kind of a, a need to document that you've made that request. So it's possible that they will retain that information about you. Um, it's definitely sort of a, you know, puts people between a rock and a hard place because you want to get this data. But on the other hand, you have to give up even more data about yourself uh, in order to do it. Um, the one thing that I would, I would say that made me more comfortable is just the knowledge that um, CCPA also has a provision um, that prevents any kind of discrimination against people from making a CCPA request. And if any um, piece of the law is going to be enforced um, and enforced very aggressively, my guess is that it's going to be that piece. If companies start to discriminate uh, or target people um, who have, uh, you know, started to make these requests. So, you know, one of my steps um, was to talk to a consumer protection attorney and have that ready to go um, so that if I ever find that I'm being discriminated against by one of these companies, um, then I'm, you know, I'm ready to defend myself against that. And um, I think the attorney general's office, again, if they're looking for any kind of CCPA case to pursue, it probably will be one around discrimination that happens after these requests are made. So obviously it's a risk. Um, it's scary to hand over your personal info, more of your personal info to these companies. Um, to me, knowing that there was that protection in the law against discrimination, and I would be able to exercise those rights even more aggressively if I ever found I was discriminated against, tipped me in that direction of wanting to do it. Um, but it's really, I think, a personal, as with many things having to do with privacy, a really personal decision. Thank you. One more question and then we'll, uh, we'll wind it down. Uh, now we've talked quite a bit about legal protections related to the providers of, of gathered information. Are, are there pieces in place in, in the codes that are, are, have been developed or are being developed that penalize use of the data in some fashion? Yeah, you know, I think that's, um... That's another great question because really, I mean, this is a, just a piece, the gathering of the data and the, the searches and, uh, and things that are happening. But, you know, once somebody is found through this, um, then you get into the, the same kinds of issues uh, around, you know, police work and, and challenges with, uh, with law enforcement and, um, and with, you know, data gathering in general. So I think in many cases, an, a search against a database like this is really just the starting point to something that can then develop a lot further. And, and obviously in the case of Robert Williams, who was arrested, uh, he's an African-American man who was arrested based on, on the output of a different uh, AI facial recognition database. Um, this can lead to you know, really serious consequences in many cases if the information in these databases isn't used responsibly. So I think you know, it's two issues, the actual search and, and placing restrictions around the gathering of data but you know, what I advocate for is all of this should be done in the same context as any other search, any other um, situation where you know, we have to reach a trade-off between um, protection and law enforcement on the one hand and, and personal privacy and rights on the other. And you know, as I point out in my, in my one zero piece, we have the constitution in the United States that's supposed to set those boundaries. So I could easily see a framework in the future where um, you know, Clearview and databases like that exist um, maybe company uh, consumers have a, a lot broader uh, control over what data these companies are gathering can opt out, but they do exist. Um, but in order to run a search, you have to get a search warrant, just like you would in order to come and search a person's house or to even search their cell phone or search their, their email um, so that these, you know, can be used when it's needed. Um, and, but we don't get these, uh, or at least there's oversight to the same extent that we have for other kinds of searches hopefully even to a broader extent than we have for other kinds of searches um, uh, for the, the kinds of outcomes that you get when you have these kind of databases available. Tom, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much uh, to all of you who are currently watching this. Uh, we have, hope you will do two more things before you leave our site, assuming you are watching this 
as the program uh, on, on our Rotary eClub of Silicon Valley website. And that is to let us know you're here. There is a, <laughs> we'll gather information. Um, they're, they're just a little bit farther down. There's an opportunity to say, yes, you know, I'm, this is my name and my email address. We, we like to, you know, just, just be able to know like, where, where are people joining us? You know, from, you know can, can we get you information about what we do and things like that? We will not bug you with it, we promise. Uh, a little farther down is the discussion forum, discuss. And, and what, are, what are your impressions? What questions come up as a result of this? Respond to thoughts of others uh, in, in the, uh, the discussion place as well. It's, it's important that we be able to engage each other on these kinds of questions, whether that's about the program itself or any other component of the meeting. As we always like to do, we hand it back to our speaker for a final word. And so Tom, I'll hand it back to you as we finish the recording. Thank you. Yeah, you know, my final word, I think, would be just to say that um, there's legislation, there's exciting things happening around this, but really, um, as we discussed here, a lot of the, the responsibility and the power here is shifting more and more to us as consumers. And I think we have a responsibility, and now we have these tools to go out and find these kinds of uses of our data, to explore them, to make these requests, to decide for ourselves where we feel comfortable, where we want data to be removed. And again, with things like CCPA, um, we're starting to be empowered more and more to do that. So I would encourage people, um, use those resources that are available to you. File requests, um, investigate, read up on this. You can follow me at 10.medium.com or on Twitter, it's TomSmith585. Um, I'll be continuing to report on this story. If you have questions, if you need access to other resources, reach out, but just leverage these things you have available to you now as consumers. Um, and you have now the power to protect yourself in a way that I think was never possible before. And that's as scary as this is, um, that's a very exciting new development for us as consumers. Excellent, Tom. Everyone, we will see you next week. Thank you.